الله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته to begin inshallah ta'ala there's an incident that happened with al qasim ibn muhammad rahimahullah was from the tabi'in and he used to visit aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha he would say salam to her every day he would pass by and say salam to her so he says that he went out one day and he passed by aisha radiyallahu anha and he found her praying it was like the duha time and so he waited for her, she was reciting the Qur'an and she was praying. And so he said to himself that because she was taking a long time, he said, let me go to the marketplace, do my business, and then come back. And then by that time she would have finished her salah. So he went to the marketplace, basically spent the day, came back, and she was still in the same rakah. She was still in the same rakah, reciting the same verse again and again and again. The verse that she was reciting, she said, um, this verse is in Surah Al-Tur, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَ نَعُذْمِ اللَّهِ وَالشَّيْطَانِ وَالْجِيمِ وَأَقْبَلَ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ قَالُوا إِنَّا كُنَّا قَبْلُ فِي أَهْلِنَا مُشْفِقِينَ فَمَنْ The brothers and sisters, these verses, they're speaking about the people of Jannah. And Aisha radiallahu anha, in her hope to be amongst the people of Jannah, she placed herself in the footsteps of the people of Jannah. And of course, we know that she's from the people of Jannah. And she put the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that the people of Jannah would say. And she recited them again and again and again. The verses meaning, that inna kunna qablu fi ahlina mushfiqeen that when the people of Jannah will enter Jannah they'll meet with each other and they'll discuss in their happiness and they will say to one another inna kunna qablu fi ahlina mushfiqeen that before time, before we used to live in fear we used to live in fear of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is how we spend our lives in fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course in the hope and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was gracious upon us. وَوَقَانَ عَذَابَ السَّمُونَ That Allah was gracious upon us and protected us and saved us from the poisonous punishment. إِنَّا كُنَّا مِنْ قَبْلُ نَدْعُو That we used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during our lives. These are the words of the people of Jannah. And so right from the beginning, tonight inshallah ta'ala, we're going to speak about conversations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that the people of Jannah will say and call and have. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us conversations and statements from the people of Hellfire. So lesson number one right from the beginning is that I want you to put yourself into the footsteps of the person who's going to say this. Put yourself into the footsteps and put these words on your tongue in this dunya. And feel what it feels like. And taste what it tastes like to say these words. And now it's beautiful that every time a verse of paradise comes up that we put those words on our mouth. And when we speak about hellfire, we immediately think of some kuffar walking in the streets. Somebody else. And let me tell you, it's a reminder for myself, a reminder for you that you will not care about those people on the Day of Judgment. You will care about yourself. And so rather you taste the pain of these words in this life, so that inshallah ta'ala you will never have to say them in the hereafter. So that the words of the people of Jannah are the words that you say inshallah ta'ala. 
Alright, so putting yourself into the first person, putting yourself into the shoes of the person who's making the statement, and taking the statement on your tongue. So every time the verse is mentioned, imagine yourself saying this. The reason that I chose this topic, when I was memorizing the Quran, when I was very young, there was a verse in the Quran that always captured my attention. And it's a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ibrahim, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْ The shaytan will say when the affair is over. And basically, I thought to myself, this is a conference that's going to take place in Hellfire, in Jahannam. How many people are going to be attending that conference? How many people? Billions and trillions of people are going to be at that conference. Everybody's going to be listening. Who is the main speaker? Shaytan is the main speaker. And they're all in hellfire. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ And this is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the speech of shaytan here in this dunya. You can read it in the Qur'an. This is what shaytan is going to say. Once the affair is over, everybody's going to be gathered. Alfred is going to be listening to shaytan to make his statement. And we'll be talking about that, inshaAllah ta'ala. So I thought to myself, if you've heard me in the uh, Parish Nations lecture, we were speaking about oft-repeated um, Topics and lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats throughout the Qur'an. If Allah repeats it so many times, then it, uh, it's incumbent upon us to pay attention to those. And so these conversations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an, it's mentioned again and again and again. And sometimes the thing that's mentioned again and again is the same thing that's mentioned again and again. This statement will happen. And so we have to either um, hope for it or protect ourselves from that accordingly, inshallah ta'ala, and take heed. One of, the, um, one of the lessons that we'll be learning, inshallah ta'ala, is about the angels. Every time someone comes into hellfire, the angels say to them, Alam yatikum nadir. Didn't a warner come to you? And I thought to myself that the angels, the angels will keep saying it, and we know what the angels are going to say. So how many people are going to be entering into hellfire? And yet, every group that comes, the angels will say the same thing to them. Didn't a warner come to you? And I thought to myself, how stupid the person who goes to hellfire must be. It's like the angels are saying to them, you're so dumb. How many times is this told to you? How many, didn't someone tell you? And then when they feel the punishment of hellfire, didn't someone tell you there would be a hellfire? Didn't somebody tell you? And yet, why are we still disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And how many chances do we get? And yet the people still disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alam yatikum nadir. And so here tonight, inshaAllah ta'ala, it's like there's no excuse after this. When the person, subhanAllah, you imagine that on the Day of Judgment, when you're about to say something, you would be like, I remember reading this in the dunya. That the day would come when I would say this. Or someone in hellfire saying, that when they're in hellfire, oh my Lord, return me back to the dunya. How foolish they're going to be and how stupid they're going to feel when they say that, knowing that in the dunya they read that one day they would, they would be saying this. They would, that when they're thrown into hellfire, they would say, oh my Lord, take us back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us about the people who entered Jannah. There was a person who was called his people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people, they killed this person. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions him in Surah Yasin, um, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قِيلَ الْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ And then he says in response, قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ قَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ he says in response, I wish my people knew When he's entered into Jannah, he says, I wish my people would know. I wish I could tell them. The subsequent generations that would come up, the men and the women, if only I could tell my people how amazing it is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives a person. How amazing it is when a person is so noble and is placed in such a high and lofty status. If only my people would know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took His words and put it in Surah Yasin. Put it in the Qur'an so that we would know the statements of the people of Jannah and the statements of the people of Hellfire. In studying this topic, 
It's, um, it's a very interesting topic, a very beautiful topic, and it's not always, uh, and I'm going to give you different categories, not all the categories we're going to be discussing tonight, inshallah ta'ala, but I've listed in uh, this lecture according to different categories. The first category is the angel's conversation with the people of Jannah, and the angel's conversation in comparison with the people of Hellfire. Okay, so conversations between the Malamika and Ahlul Jannah and Ahlul Naam. Okay, so that's one category. Secondly, a category of the conversations of Ahlul Jannah, the people of Jannah, with their family members. The conversations of the people of Hellfire with their family members. The third category is the conversation of the people of Jannah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them, their conversations with the other people of Jannah. Right? So it's like, you're there for all eternity, what are you going to talk about? Beautiful things that they talk about. And the conversations of the people of Hellfire amongst themselves. The conversations of the people of Hellfire conversing with the people of Hellfire. You know, in these categories, there's still a couple more categories, but it's interesting, a lot of times you have this question when the non-Muslims ask, or soon-to-be Muslims ask, they say, um, Jannah, it seems like everything is Jannah, is always talking about things that are you know, exclusive to men. Right? Oh, and men, men will have wives. Like, that's it. There's nothing else in the Quran that speaks about Jannah. And usually this is a misunderstanding. Actually, one of the amazing things when you read the Quran is that it's not just about... And of course that's included, right? About Jannah and the, and the Na'im. But one of the amazing um, blessings in life is having good companionship. And having intellectual conversations. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even shows us that that's part of the blessing of Jannah. Is the companionships and the intellectual conversations that take place. And inshallah ta'ala we're going to be touching upon that. Ahlul Jannah, the people of Jannah with Jannah, and the people of Hellfire with Hellfire. And it's actually interesting that the people of Hellfire, it is intellectual conversations as well. It's very deep. The problem is that they weren't that intelligent during the dunya. In Hellfire, they're very intelligent. They realize, they believe, yes, this is Hellfire, all of this. They're very intelligent in Hellfire, when it's too late. The next category is the people of Jannah, speaking with the people of Hellfire. Okay, the people of Jannah speaking with the people of Hellfire, and vice versa, the people of Hellfire conversing with the people of Jannah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. The next category after that is the people of Jannah, how they speak to, the, their, to themselves, their internal dialogue. Right, internal dialogue, in fact, that's probably the person you speak with the most in your life is yourself. Inside your mind, all your thoughts and so on, you're constantly asking questions, answering questions, making statements, conversing with yourself. And so you'll see the internal dialogue of the people of Jannah with themselves, what they'll be saying to themselves, and the internal dialogue of the people of Hellfire, what they'll be saying to themselves. And finally, and, and these last categories, inshallah ta'ala, will be in our, um, in our part two. And that is the conversation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the people of Hellfire and the conversation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the people of Jannah. And so to begin inshallah ta'ala with the first category and that is with the Malaika. The Malaika, and it's a beautiful topic in of itself, the Malaika, <coughs> they are a part of the human being's life from the beginning to the end. There's no part of your life except that the angels are part of it. From the moment your soul was breathed into, your, into, your, uh, into the janeen, into the embryo, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to breathe the soul. Correct? And throughout your life you had an angel on your right, an angel on your left, and they're writing down your good deed right now, inshallah ta'ala, that you came to this lecture, and they're writing it down. And the angels are in Sakina, and when a person does bad, the angel's still writing it down, doing Tawbah. When a person goes for Jum'ah, when a person dies, the extraction of the soul, taking the soul to paradise, help. the angels are consistently a part of the human being's life. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us conversation that the angels, when a person dies, that's when you begin to speak directly with the angels. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm not gonna um, separate these in here are all the verses that speak about Jannah, here are about all the verses that speak about hellfire. I'm going to interchange them. Right? So one verse about hellfire, one about paradise. And so the first of these verses is the angels enter uh, the angels dragging the people of hellfire to hellfire. Now, there's verses that speak about how they're being dragged and, and the horror of that day, and we're not really getting into that, that's another topic as well, but we're focusing instead on what are the angels saying to them. And so in this verse, this is in Surah Al-Mulk, verse 8, 9, and 10, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Is it permissible, you know, to drink, you know, and all, all these things, haram, haram, haram. 
Vietnam, and so on. And then you think to yourself, not the whole Muslim community is hearing a lecture like this. Even online people listening to this, not the whole Muslim Ummah is going to be listening to these lectures. So did a warner come to them or not? Every Salat al Jummah, correct? Every Salat al Jummah. Even let's say for example, someone will say, we didn't know that we had to do this. How is it some people, they live in a Muslim country, and they'll say, we never knew we had to pray five times a day. How is that possible? That you never heard that? The thing is that, yes, it was heard, but it never entered the heart. It was heard, but it just went from one ear, and maybe it never even went inside. The wax blocked it, and it just went and kept outside. Didn't a warner come to you in something as... Um, simple as Jum'ah prayer. Every Jum'ah prayer, the people are getting the message. Establish your salah, pay the zakah, fast from Ramadan, go for hajj. All these statements are being said again and again and again. Didn't a warner come to you? They say, Bala, qad ja'ana nadir. Yes, the warner did come. But this is the situation, because so many times people hear a khutbah, and hear the message, yet they don't follow it. Yes, we did hear the message, and someone did tell us, فَكَذَّبْنَا well, we called them a liar. They're lying. فَكَذَّبْنَا It's not true. It's not really happening. وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't reveal anything. There's no message. It's all coincidence. I'm in doubt. I don't know. Is this really the truth or not? This was their excuse. Yes, the messenger did come to them. Yes, they were warned. But they just kept falling back on. I'm not quite sure. So let me just continue living my life of disobedience. Didn't the warner come to them? Yes, he came. And every time a group comes to hellfire, they're going to get the same question. Didn't a warner come to you? Didn't somebody tell you? Just imagine the thing that you're doing haram or I'm doing haram. Let's put ourselves into that haram position. That moment when we're doing haram. And ask yourself, didn't somebody tell you that this was haram? And of course, if you know it's haram, somebody told you. Alam yantikum nadirin. Qalub alam. Somebody did come. Somebody did tell us. Now, on the opposite side, the angels greeting the people of paradise. Because the angels, just like they'll be dragging people to hellfire, they will be escorting Ahlul Jannah, the people of Jannah, to Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us part of that entourage. Okay, it's an entourage with the people of Jannah, and it's an entourage that's being guided and taken, you know, escorted by the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a punishment and a reward in of itself. The gatekeepers of hellfire look different than the, than the gatekeepers of paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, جنات عدن يدخلونها ومن صلح من آبائهم وأزواجهم وذرياتهم والملائكة يدخلون عليهم من كل باب سلام عليكم بما صبرتم سلام عليكم بما صبرتم this is in Surah Al-Ra'ad, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْمَلَائِكَ That the garden of, of um, Eden, جَنَّاتُ عَدْنِ جَنَّاتُ عَدْنِ يَدْخُلُونَ the, the garden of Eden, the everlasting garden, a garden. And in this dunya, every time you see a beautiful garden, you can't live in the garden. Right? If you live in the garden, there's snakes, there's worms, there's bugs, you can't lie down anywhere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, جَنَّاتُ عَدْنِ that the Adn is the, the garden that you're going to be living in this beauty. SubhanAllah, even if you look at the most amazing resorts in the world, what they do to make it so beautiful is they basically make a floor to ceiling wall, a glass, so that you can be amongst the elements without suffering the harms of the elements. In Jannah, you will be fully immersed in all those elements, with the rivers flowing from underneath. يَدْخُلُونَهَا They will enter it. And a lot of times people think of entering Jannah by themselves. But it's not by yourselves. Inshallah ta'ala, you're going to be entering with your wives, with your children, with your family members. وَمَنْ صَلَحَ Those who are righteous from their parents 
and their and their spouses and their children. And the angels shall enter on them from every gate. These are the gatekeepers of Jannah. Salam alaykum Peace be upon you. And now, salam alaykum. We say assalamu alaykum, right? This statement of salam, you'll actually see that everywhere in Jannah, and it comes up in different categories. Ahl Jannah with Ahl Jannah, with each other, they're saying, illa qilan salam and salam. Amongst themselves, they were saying, we're in peace. And the other person is saying in back, we're in peace. And peace, everywhere in Jannah is peace and serenity. And the angels in Jannah, when the people of Jannah enter, this is the statement, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Because of your patience in the dunya, because of your sabr, that there's peace upon you now. Fani'ma And what an amazing, what a beautiful, everlasting this is your home. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, there are actually um, verses where the people of hellfire, they call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here, this, and, and that inshallah ta'ala, that will be like in our part two. But here, the angels of hellfire, when the people of hellfire lose hope in calling upon Allah, because Allah is not answering them. They forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the dunya. They didn't call upon Allah in the dunya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And so in the hereafter, they're trying to call them to Allah, but Allah is not answering them. And so when they lose hope in that, and I thought to myself, subhanAllah, you know how when someone goes to jail, sometimes there will be a criminal that has actually done the crime. And everyone will try everything that they can do to try to get this criminal out. They were like, what loopholes are there? Who can we speak to? What lawyers? How can we appeal? A person, they, they can never, you know, just accept. They just don't, nobody goes to joke jail and just says, okay, I'm it. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to fight it. So the people of Hellfire, they're trying everything possible to get out. What can we do to get out? Who can we go to? Who can we speak to? How can we discuss this? So they call upon Allah. When they lose hope of that, and again, we'll be detailed in, in what they're calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their promises they're trying to make. But then they start calling the gatekeepers of hellfire. And now if there is an effort of the most toughest, most angriest, most meanest of the creation of Allah, it is the gatekeepers of hellfire. And they're trying to seek mercy from them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ فِي النَّارِ لِخَزَنَةِ جَهَنَّمَ دْعُوا رَبَّكُمْ يُخَفِّفْ عَنَّا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ فِي النَّارِ لِخَزَنَةِ جَهَنَّمَ That the people in hellfire are saying to the gatekeepers of hellfire. These are the ones that Allah instructed to maintain forever hellfire. And they're calling them, like they're trying to get some you know, trying to get some mercy from them. This is their statement to them. They say to them, You make dua to Allah. Make dua to your Lord. They've lost hope in making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they're telling the angel, Listen, angel, you make dua. To whom? They don't even say, Udru Rabbana. They lost hope even in calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their Lord. They said, Ud'u Rabbak. Make dua to your Lord. For what? What do, you, what do you think they're asking for? In fact, they asked Allah their dua earlier was to destroy us. Let this punishment end. But unfortunately, that would be mercy. That's mercy. That's what they were hoping for, the atheist. That's the atheist best case scenario, is that there's no hereafter. That's the atheist best case. That's the better hope that there's nothing in the hereafter. That's the only way he's going to survive. The person who disbelieved in Allah. That's the only thing. So they've lost hope of even asking for this. Asking for this, so they say, Ud'u Rabbakum yukhaffif anna. Call your Lord to lighten, 
to lighten the punishment. So they're not, they don't even hope for the punishment to stop, because it's not stopping, and they don't even hope for that. Their standards are so low. They're like, they're saying, just lighten the punishment. For how long do you want the punishment lightened? They've lost hope of even lightening the punishment forever. They say, يُخَفِّفْ عَنَّا يَوْمًا مِنَ الْعَذَى We just want one day break. It's not even a break. Just the intensity turned down for one day. That's all we're asking. Call your Lord and ask Him if He'll lighten one day. And so the angels say back to them, أَلَمْ تَقُوا تَنْتِيكُمْ رُسُلُكُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ And this is even a scene that's absurd, like, when do the angels respond to them? After thousands and thousands of years, they actually get a response. Nobody's answering. There's nobody like standing there that they're talking to. And so when the angels finally speak to them, it's again, they said to this, or they said this to them already. Didn't the messenger come to you? Did somebody tell you this was haram? أَلَمْ تَقْوَ تَقْتِيكُمْ رُسُلُكُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ Didn't the messengers come to you with the clear signs? You clearly knew that there was a hellfire. You clearly knew what you had to do. Didn't the messengers come? What can they say in response? There is no answer except this. قَالُوا فَدْرَ Then the, the angels say in the response, they say, then make dua. Make dua as much as you want. فَمَا دُعَى الْكَافِرِينَ إِلَّا فِي الْمَنَى Make dua as much as you want makes no difference because the dua of the kafir is nothing but a stray and it's just gone. It means nothing. And the punishment continues. That's the Quran of Allah. In the verses they say وَنَادَوْ يَا مَالِكُ لِيَقْضِعَ they call out, وَنَادَوْ يَا مَالِكْ Malik is the, the chief of the gatekeepers of Al-Khair. لِيَقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكْ And this was before when they had higher standards of what they were hoping for. They say, may your Lord destroy us and finish us off. قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ مَاكِثُونَ And Malik says to them in response, no, you're going to stay. You're going to continue. And it continues. لَقَدْ جِئْنَاكُمْ بِالْحَقِّ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَكُمْ لِلْحَقِّ كَارِهُونَ Where Malik says to them, إِنَّكُمْ مَاكِثُونَ You're going to stay. لَقَدْ جِئْنَاكُمْ بِالْحَقِّ That the حق was brought to you. You got it. The books came to you, the messengers came to you, the reminders came to you. Allah put an internal GPS, your heart, your qalb, that told you that when you were doing something right, or when you're doing something wrong, it told you that this was wrong. It kept telling you this was wrong, this was wrong, the kadabt. And so you disbelieved, you just shut it off. You're trying to shut it off, but you couldn't do it. Forget ma Allah min shaykh, that Allah didn't reveal anything. Everything, subhanAllah, will be refused to them. Everything refused. Whether they ask to be obliviated, whether they ask to, you know, come out of hellfire, if they ask, and this is more the conversations that they're calling upon Allah, and this is, subhanAllah, you'll see that this is the beginning of their standard. When they first go to hellfire, and they see hellfire, they're asking Allah to send them back to the dunya. And what a joke that is. That they're saying, oh, now that we've seen hellfire, give us another chance. Okay, now we know that this hellfire sent us back. And th that's earlier they were asking for that. They lost hope of ever going back to the dunya. They lost hope of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They lost hope of being just obliviated so that there's nothing left. And they've lost hope of even the punishment of hellfire being lightened for even a part of a day.
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Zumar, the people of Hellfire, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرًا That the people of Hellfire will be dragged to, um, to Hellfire in groups. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا فُتِحَتْ أَبْلَوْهَا Until they come to it, and um, for those of you who memorize Surah Al-Zumar, you'll know, especially if you're reading to the Shaykh, حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا فُتِحَتْ أَبْلَوْهَا It says, until they come to it, and the, the, the gates of hellfire are open. There, and there's no wow right there. And then the next verse, like I said, if you're memorized to Zumba, you'll know that the next verse, it comes, حَتَّى إِذَا جَابُوهَا When it talks about the people of hellfire, وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا So there's a wow that speaks about the people of hellfire, and there is, ah, sorry, there's a wow that speaks about the people of Jannah, but there's no wow, the letter wow, the Arabic letter wow, that speaks about the people of hellfire. And so once Sheikh beautifully described this, and he said like, hellfire, the gates opening, there is no prelude to the gates opening. Meaning that it opens as a shock. If you've ever been on these rides at like an amusement park, you know these horror rides where you go in like a wheelbarrow, and you're driving around and all of a sudden something opens and you drop. Usually they can't do that if you drop like that, but they'll open something like, the horror is the shock, correct? You know what I'm saying? So in hellfire, in hellfire, what happens is that when they come to the hellfire, hatta idaja, they're being dragged and they can hear it and all that, then the doors open and they fall into hellfire. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهُمْ And then the khazana, the gatekeepers of hellfire say to them, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ رُسُلُ مِنْ Didn't messengers come to you before? يَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِهِمْ Right, didn't they mention the verses? Didn't they remind you of this day? And the people will say yes. And so in the other verse after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, اتَّخَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمْرَةِ In groups, they're going to be escorted to Jannah. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاهُوهَا Until they arrive at Jannah, وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا There's a while before فُتِحَتْ And so the gates of Jannah, they open slowly. They open slowly. And as the people come closer to Jannah, Jannah actually comes closer to the people. And the Jannah, uh, the Jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for the believers, the gates open up, slowly, slowly, slowly intensifying the love and the desire for the people of Jannah to enter Jannah. And Jannah is alive. As you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to Jannah and speaking to Hellfire. Jannah loves the believers. And so just like the believers love to enter Jannah, Jannah loves for the believers to enter it. And there's a beautiful hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said about the fragrance of Jannah, and verily that the fragrance of Jannah can be smelt from a distance of 500 years. From a distance of 500 years. Now if you're 500 years away from Jannah, and you can still smell Jannah, then what about when you're right in front of the doors of Jannah. And SubhanAllah, in preparing this, um, this lecture, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about one of the women of Jannah. And the Prophet ﷺ said that if she smiled at the earth, the whole earth would be filled of beautiful fragrance. Just by her smile. And I said, wow. <laughs> because subhanAllah, there's, it's, it's summertime now, and sometimes you open your window, and people smoke outside, right? They smoke outside. They're not the people of hellfire, inshallah, the difference of meaning about smoking. But I think to myself, when you open the window, subhanAllah, the air is polluted by them being outside. And I think of it, how can you pollute the atmosphere that you can smell smoke coming into your house even though the person is outside in the open air, they've polluted the whole atmosphere just by what they're doing, the action that they're doing. So I thought and saw this hadith that the whole earth would be filled with a beautiful fragrance from her smile. 
And her, her, the shine from her would eclipse the sun and the moon. Just from her smile. Imagine being in proximity. And, and I know sisters are like, oh, what about us? The sisters are like, oh. <laughs> yeah, sister, any description of a woman of Jannah is obviously a description of you and much more than that. Right? That you would be much more than that. These are the women of Jannah. How about the believing women who because of their patience they entered into Jannah? And so there is no, as the Prophet ﷺ, this woman said to the Prophet ﷺ, or the Prophet ﷺ said to her, that no old people will enter into paradise. Old women don't go to Jannah. And she became very sad and distressed at this, and she was very old, and she said, Ya Rasulullah, how, how can this be, you know? And the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would turn back all her youthfulness. So in Jannah, it's complete youthfulness for all of eternity. All of eternity. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا What will the angels say to the people when they enter Jannah? It is in Surah Zumar. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ It's everywhere. This is the statement. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your ears hear that statement. سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ قِبْتُ فَدْفُلُوهَا خَالِتِ That peace be upon you. Peace in everything that the word peace means. You know, in life, we're always more like, hey, peace, right? <laughs> right? People bump our stickers, peace, peace. What does real peace mean? Real peace is when a person enters Jannah. That's real peace. And then the angels say to them, Thibetum. Thibetum is a very interesting word. It's translated, I have one of the translations, it says, you have become pure. The angels say to the people as they enter Jannah, You become pure, so enter it, and you will enter it forever. Enter into Jannah forever and ever, for all of eternity. And so this, um, this statement, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says in Zad al-Ma'ad, he has a whole section on it, called, uh, about the hadith of the Prophet in which he says, Inna Allah qayyibun la yaqbalu illa qayyiba. That Allah is qayyib, is pure, and only accepts that which is pure. Inna Allah qayyibun la yaqbalu illa qayyiba. And so a person would say, oh you know for example, can I do hajj with haram money? Can I build a masjid with riba, with you know, interest? Can I you know, um, do this action, you know, pray, and hopefully some woman will see me and she'll want to marry me. Allah is qayyib, is pure, and only said, accepts those things that are done purely for the sake. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so if a person commits sins in the dunya, then what purifies them? What purifies them? What makes them qayyib? Tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for example, Umrah, right? A performance of Umrah, the Prophet sallallahu said, Al-Umrah to ila al-Umrah kafaratun ima baynahuma, right? That the Umrah, performing Umrah to the next Umrah, is a purification for that which comes between them. And so many things. The Prophet sallallahu said, whoever says this dua, the reward, you know, their sins are forgiven and so on. All these different things that we have, the blessings of Allah, in order that we would become pure. But let's say a person's tawbah, they don't do enough tawbah, in this dunya, in the hereafter, they might be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then they'll have the tawbah in the hereafter and enter into Jannah. Or, if they're a Muslim, they might still enter hellfire. And if they enter hellfire, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, it's because they're still not yet qayyim. They're still not qayyim. Because nobody enters Jannah except that they're qayyim. And so the hellfire, the time that they would spend in hellfire, is to purify them. It's so that when they come out and they're washed, that the fire of hellfire punish them. And even in this dunya, the sicknesses that we go through, and the things that harm us, and the sadnesses, when we're patient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of that is a purification. So that the angels, when the person enters hellfire, they say, Salaamu alaykum, qibtum. You've become pure. And so enter into paradise forever. And so the people of Jannah, this is actually their statement, and I include statements like this, they're saying these statements like to themselves and to each other. That all praises to Allah, all thanks to Allah. Alhamdulillah. 
And so you will see this statement recurring again and again and again in the Quran. This is the statement of the people of Jannah. Alhamdulillah. In one of the verses they say, Alhamdulillah In this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they will say, Alhamdulillah sadaqana wa'adah. But that's the statement. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We made it. Alhamdulillah alladhi sadaqana wa'adah. That He fulfilled His promise to us. Didn't Allah promise you? Didn't the messengers come to you? Yeah, they came and we believed in them. And that's what you will see in the statements that they say to each other. They're like, Alhamdulillah, when they're talking with each other, that the messengers came, Alhamdulillah, we believe them. Alhamdulillah, so and so, this guy over here, we didn't believe in him. This guy used to tell us, don't go to the masjid, don't believe in Allah, don't follow the Prophet, don't do this. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we didn't believe him. Alhamdulillah, we called him a liar. And that's their statement with each other. And we'll get to it, inshallah. فَنِعْمَ أَجْرَ الْعَامِلِينَ And what an excellent reward for those who work uh, righteousness. Abu Huraira, رضي الله تعالى عنه, he narrates that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, يُنَادِ مُنَادِ Some, a caller will call. When the people of Jannah enter Jannah, يَا أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ إِنَّ لَكُمْ أَن تَصْحُوا فَلَا تَسْقَمُوا أَبَدًا SubhanAllah, this is something, you know, when you, when you visualize your goals, and imagine when the people enter Jannah, the first thing that happens, I remember once there was a relative of mine, a young relative of mine, and we had a barbecue. And this young relative of mine, he loved the barbecue so much, it was so yummy and so delicious. And I remember saying, him saying to, uh, to my father, and saying to my mother, he said, like, Jeddu, can we eat this food tomorrow? Before he even ate the food today, SubhanAllah that he knows that in this dunya, yes, there is blessings, but it doesn't last forever. Right? How long is the barbecue going to A couple of hours, two hours, three hours. How long is your meal going to go? Three hours. That's why people overeat. Because they want to continue the, the, the na'im. Right? But they can't continue when the body says, we've had enough. This is the dunya. You can't keep doing this. So in Jannah, in Jannah, what will happen is someone will call out and say, in, Ya Ahl Jannah, O people of Jannah, Inna lakum an tasro, kala tasqamu abada. That you're going to be healthy for all eternity. And you will never become sick. So sickness, forget about that. There's no sickness for you. And so you're saying to yourself, Yeah, you just imagine everybody celebrating that, right? And then the, the statement is, you know, like, Oh people of Jannah, guess what? Bonus number two. That's not part of the idea. That's my own idea. وَإِنَّ لَكُمْ أَن تَحْيُوا فَلَا تَمُوتُ أَبَدًا And you're going to be alive forever, you'll never die. And now, when a person's going to be alive forever, even in this dunya, subhanAllah, if you put someone in a retirement home and say, you're going to be here forever. This is punishment. Right? This is in the dunya. In the dunya, it's almost like you're going to be here forever. And they're like, no, this is, you know, what are we going to do forever? We're going to watch, you know, movies again and again and again forever. This isn't the life. But in Jannah, they're having so much fun that you're going to live forever. They're like, yes, this is not going to end. Third thing, Ya Ahl al-Jannah, Wa inna lakum an tashku fala tahramu abadan that you're going to be youthful and you're never going to grow old. And so a person, yes, they might be there forever, but eventually they'll get old and they won't be able to enjoy it the way that they enjoyed it when they were young. And so if we call out to them that you're going to be young forever and you will never get old. Yes, right? And the fourth thing, وَإِنَّ لَكُمْ أَن تَنْعَمُ فَلَا تَبْأَسُ أَبَدًا you're going to enjoy Jannah forever. There will never come a time where you become bored with Jannah. There will never become a time like that. Because in this dunya, we can't comprehend that. No matter what a person gets in the dunya, you can only have so much of the things in the dunya. You're only, you can only sit at the beach. How long can you sit at the beach for? You can sit at the beach for maybe one day, two days, three days, and then you're like, I gotta go do something. Right? 
And that's why people, they die soon after retirement. Because they're like, what am I going to do with my life? And then they just, not that they kill themselves, but just the depression and so on and so forth. It's like, what am I going to do with my life now? But this is in general. And this is the way it is. The next category is, I set up this category, and I actually didn't find um, too many examples for it. I didn't find too many examples for it. Of course, when a person enters into Jannah, this next category is the people of Jannah speaking with their family members. And the people of Hellfire speaking with their family members. Of course, there are verses where people of Jannah are entering into Jannah with their family members. Such as the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udkhulu al-jannata antum wa aswajukum tukbaru. Right, enter into paradise you and your wives. So now, and here's a good point for all those sisters who are worried about, you know, uh, women in jannah and so on and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, enter into jannah you and your spouses. So that means, if you're married or not, you're going to get into jannah and you'll be married inshallah ta'ala. Whether you're married or not, but you're going to be entering into Jannah with your righteous spouse, inshallah ta'ala. And also, here's a special point for those who are worried about Jannah, right? Aswajukum zawj in Arabic means your spouse. And it actually applies to male and female. So whenever it mentions in the Quran, aswajukum, your spouse, it doesn't mean your wives. It means your, your mates, right? And that could be male or female. So a woman reading this verse would be enter into paradise you and your husband. And someone, a, a male reading this verse would say enter into Jannah you and your wife. The Arabic word carries both of those meanings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the verses speaks about when the person gets the book with their right hand. And it's interesting, this is sort of the dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contrasts between the person who gets the book in their right hand, the person who gets the book in their left hand, the person who gets their book in their right hand, they want their family members, and they want like their mother and their family members to find out about the book. And the person who gets the book in their left hand, they don't want anybody to know. So in fact, I actually didn't find any verses of help of the people of Hellfire speaking with their family members. They're on their own. There's no family members for them. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks first about um, the people who get the book with their right hand. If you get your book in your right hand, and imagine that, this is the book that has all your deeds, just by virtue of you getting it in your right hand, you know you've passed. And if you get it in your left hand, you know you failed. You don't even have to look into it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ As for the person who is given the book, you're given it. It's not that you're taking it, you're given it. The Amin with his right hands. Even if you say it in our eye, you don't even, I haven't even translated it, you can kind of guess what, what the words mean. Can you guess what it means? Because even in the Arabic language, just the meant, the meant, the prolongation. It's like, whoa! When you pass your exam, when you pass your exams, right? You're like, let's say the biggest exam that you take, the MCAT exams, right? The biggest exam. Some of us understand this, some of us don't understand. When you pass your MCAT exams, what do you do when you go home to your mom? Mom, I passed my exam. What if you went to Hellfire after? Who cares about that? Who cares about that? Nothing in this dunya matters unless your intentions are for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who cares about these exams in the dunya if a person fails the exam in the hereafter? Who cares? SubhanAllah, in, in Surah Al-Fajr where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people of Hellfire, this is what they say to themselves. يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي قَدَّمْتُ لِحَيَاتِي they 
say, if only I prepared for my life. And all these exams that we talk about, these exams in the dunya, the MCAT, LSAT, this exam, that exam, we think that it's preparing for our life. But it's not preparing for our life. It's preparing specifically for our dunya and the material side of our dunya. As for preparation of our life, that is in praying Fajr, praying Duha, and praying Asr, praying Maghrib, and praying Isha, and doing that till the day you die sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your belief in Allah, your zakah, your siyam, your hajj. That is preparing for your life. And so how many mothers and fathers would keep their children asleep because they have an exam coming up later in the day? They don't want to wake them up for so long because the dunya exam is coming up. How many mothers and fathers will forbid their children from fasting because of these exams in the dunya? I'm trying to think of some other reason they would forbid them from fasting, but it's actually, it's all related to academics. It's all preparing for materialistic dunya. فَيَقُولُ We return back to that person. هَا أُمَقْرَأُوا كِتَابِهِ It's like you want to show everybody. You know when someone doesn't want you to see their marks? It's because they fail. You know that. But you know, if you've ever, at the end of the exam, you go to say, so what did you get on the mark? What did you get on the exam? And the person says, I got such and such. What did you get? He's like, I got such and such. And then you go to someone, what did you get? He's like, it's none of your business. What do we know from that person? They fail. How مُقْرَأُوا كِتَابِيَ The person saying, إِنِّي ظَلَنْتُ أَنِّي مُلَاقِ الْحِسَابِيَ I knew that I would be meeting this hisab one day. I knew that this would happen. Because there was a halaqa one day where we were reading the verses of the Qur'an and I remember in the dunya reading this verse in the Qur'an and it brings me so much joy today to be able to say this. To be able to share with your mother and your father and all your family members, inshallah ta'ala may Allah enter all of them into Jannah. Read it. Look at it. Open book. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ Radiya is he's pleased with it. Are you pleased, O people of Jannah? We are pleased. Are you pleased? Do you want anything? No, we got everything. SubhanAllah, even I, I thought to myself, if the people of Jannah just got to imagine what they would want in Jannah, you couldn't even imagine a Jannah that you would want to live in. Usually human beings, their vision of, of their blessing, they can't even envision something that great. And so the Prophet said about Jannah, فِيهَا مَا لَا عَيْنُ رَأَتْ In paradise is that which the eye has never seen. وَلَا أُذْنٌ سَمِعَتْ And the ear has never heard. وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ that no soul has ever envisioned or imagined something like that. A blessing is so amazing like that. And as for the people of Hellfire, I couldn't find any verses. Inshallah, you can look and see if you find any verses that people of Hellfire speak with family members. I couldn't find any in the Quran. I did find conversations. And these you can find in the Quran with people of Jannah speaking with family members in the dunya. And an example of that was Nuh with his son. Nuh with his son, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Nuh said to his son, Ya Bunayya Rukab Ma'ana, Ya Bunayya Rukab Ma'ana wa la takum ma'al kafirin. Oh my son, and, um, get on the boat with us and don't be with the disbelievers. And his son responded back, قَالَ سَأَوِي إِلَىٰ جَبَلِ يَعْصِمُنِي مِنَ الْمَانِ His son was a disbeliever and he said, I will go to the mountains and the mountains will save me from hellfire. It will save me from the water. SubhanAllah, it's interesting. It's almost as if his son was a scientist. How many mountains get drowned? So he's like saying, mountains never get drowned, or these mountains that we have, the water level never reaches that high. So I don't want to go with my father and be with the believers who are very few and everybody mocks them and so on. And I don't want to be with the, I don't want to, no, I'm not going to go with the disbelievers. So let me find a middle path. Somewhere in between Islam and Kufr. It's called hypocrisy. Nifat. 
And so he went, he said, I'll go to the mountain to Awi la Jabal Yasimuni min al Ma. And Nuh said, Qala la Asim al Yawma min Amin Allah illa Marahim. There is no protection from the affair and the decree of Allah except those who He has mercy. Wahala bayna hum al Mawjid, then a wave came between them, and Nuh alayhi son was drowned. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Nuh, that he wasn't one of your children. He wasn't your son. Inna ulaysa min ahl. Because of his deeds that were not righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us about Ibrahim alayhi salam and his father Azam. Right? Where, where he said, Ya abati la ta'abud al-shaytan. Oh my father, don't worship the devil. Inna shaytana kana lil-rahmani asim. And then Nuh and Ibrahim salam, son said to him, قَالَ أَرَاغِبٌ أَنْتَ عَنْ آلِهَتِنَا يَا إِبْرَاهِيمٌ لَإِنْ لَمْ تَنْتَهِ لَأَرْجُ مَنْ مَكَ وَهْجُرْ لِمَنِي Ibrahim salam's father said to him, so this is his own father, he said to him, are you preferring something other than our idols? If you don't stop this, if you don't stop calling to this way, you don't stop worshipping this God, لَأَرْجُ مَنْ مَكَ He said, I'm going to stone you. وَهْجُرْنِي مَنْ يَهْنِي And get away from me. And Ibrahim a.s. said, Salaamu alaykum. The next category after this is the category of the people of Jannah speaking with the people of Jannah. And the people of Hellfire speaking with the people of Hellfire. Before I go to this category, I want to remind you of the love of the Sahaba for Jannah. And how these verses and these statements, it was always part of their life. Prophet this is on the day of Badr. After the Prophet gave his speech, on, and before the battle of Badr, he said to the companions, this is now the battle is about to begin. Qumu, he said, stand up. إِلَىٰ جَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ He said, now stand up for a Jannah, a paradise, whose expanse is the heavens and the earth. And next time you look out at the skies, or you're on an airplane and you look out to all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as far as your eye can see, the Jannah is the expanse of the heavens and the earth. SubhanAllah, I was in it's such a beautiful place. I was in uh, Keynes, Australia, just actually a few weeks ago. And I was, it was so beautiful there. And this is like near the coral, the coral reef that Allah created. It doesn't belong to the Australian. Allah created the coral reef and Keynes, Australia, all of that stuff, the mountains and the beautiful weather and all of that. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, my family wasn't there. And I said, I wish I could bring my family here. But then there's Kufar here walking around. It's like, going to be like, kind of like, you know, it's a bad, it's like the app, so you're not, it just wouldn't work out. And then I thought to myself, subhanAllah, that you start thinking, oh, if only in Jannah I could have something like this. And I thought to myself, I get to live in like Keynes, Australia, I remember that all of eternity of my religion. Like, I start thinking about all the blessings of the dunya, as much blessings and as much beauty and expansiveness of the heavens and the earth that you can see in this dunya, the Jannah is the expanse of the heavens and the earth. So the Prophet said this in the battle of others, stand up for a Jannah's expanse in the heavens and the earth. So one of the companions, his name was Umair, he said, and I thought to myself, what would be the English equivalent of Bachin Bach? Bachin Bach is like, it's, we would say in our language, we'd say like, dang. Right? <laughs> we say, we would say that. Mm. So depending on you know, what, what slang you're into, there's other like, you, it's just a statement, it just goes like, mm, like that. And so the Prophet said, so, that's the, what they would say. So the Prophet said to Umair, he said, Ma hamalaka ala qawlika bakhin bakh. He said, what made you make that statement? What made you make that statement, bakhin bakh? And Umair, رضي الله تعالى عنه, he said, Ya Rasulullah, he's saying that, um, he said, La wallahi ya Rasulullah, illa rajahna kuna min ahli. He said, it's nothing, Ya Rasulullah, except that I'm hoping and aspiring to be amongst those who enter into that Jannah. That's what I'm saying. I just want to be one of them. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ responded to him, فَإِنَّكَ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا That you're one of those people who are going to go to Jannah. You're going to be one of those people who are of its companionship. Now, Umayr, at this point, now if you heard that you're going to Jannah, and Umayr, radiallahu anhu, he had dates in his hands. So it's like, you know, you have to go somewhere. I think subhanAllah, an analogy that I mean, you know how you have little children, and they want to do something that's very fun, and you tell them, just drink your milk first. And drinking the milk takes too long. Right? They're like, no, I want to go play. No, just drink your milk first. So like, if I live long enough to drink this milk, it's, it's too long. Umayr was eating dates, and he's like, this is taking too long. And so he threw the dates on the ground. He threw the dates on the ground and he entered into the battlefield of the Allah Ta'ala. And he was killed shaking in that battle. The people of Jannah are the people of Jannah, and the people of Hellfire are the people of Hellfire. Before we um, break from Maghrib Salah, inshaAllah Ta'ala, we'll just take this one um, verse of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that is what we started with. The conference in Hellfire. And that is Shaytan speaking to the people of Hellfire. And so everybody's gathered. This is the after the affair. The people who are entered Jannah, they're in Jannah. The people who are in Hellfire, they're in Hellfire. Everybody's for eternity. Eternity has begun. There is no death from now forward. All called is Shaytan. Now Shaytan is calling out to everybody. How many people are listening to this conference? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. We don't want to be in that position where we're in Hellfire listening to this conference. We take heed from it from now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the shaytan will say, once the affair is over, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ He's telling the people of Hellfire that Allah promised you the truth. This whole time, remember what all, you know, all the things the messengers said? They were telling the truth. Remember all those people that came to you telling you about paradise and hellfire and stuff like that? They were telling the truth. The promise was the truth. That there was something in the hereafter. And I promised you as well. But I broke my promise to you. What are the promises of Shaytan? Every time you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking that you'll get some enjoyment, or it's a delusion, that's the promise of shaitan. It's not the truth. There's anything that other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding, this is the, dis- uh, the delusion, the deceivement that shaitan whispers into the people. وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ And I had no power over you. Shaitan, when a person disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anybody force them? Grab them by their hand, go to that haram website and check out that pornography. Anybody force that person? It was just a whisper. Anybody force the person to go into the bar and drink the alcohol? No. Even the kuffar, they don't even, maybe they market it. And they put advertisements. And they pay a lot of money for that. But they, nobody forces the person. I had no power over you. No power. Except that I whispered to you and invited you, فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْنِي And you've answered me. It's tijaba. It's like you said, لَبَّيْكَ We're here. You know, take our soul. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُ أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't blame me, but blame yourself. And so everybody wants to blame someone. Let's blame the shaytan. He, the shaytan is saying, don't blame me, blame me, blame yourself. مَا أَنَا بِمُسْرِخِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُسْرِخِكُمْ That you can avail me nothing, and I don't listen to your cries in any way, and you don't listen to my cries in any way. There's no way that I can help you, and there's no way that you can help me. إِنِّي كَفَرْتُ بِمَا أَشْرَقْتُمُونِ مِنْ قَبْ He said, I have nothing to do with the shirk that you used to do. إِنَّ اللَّهَ مِنَ لَهُ عَذَابُ that the people, the disbelievers, will have a previous penalty. And so this is Shaytan officially cutting himself off. There is no one to blame except themselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and we bring inshallah ta'ala for 
Alright, so continuing on, we were speaking about um, the category that we're talking about is people of Jannah, speaking with the people of Jannah, the people of Hellfire speaking with the people of Hellfire, meaning their conversations amongst each other. And we um, said earlier about Shaytan and Shaytan's statement to the people of Hellfire, basically washing his hands from them, saying that all I did was just tell you, you follow me, so don't blame me and blame yourselves. And so now we see the conversations amongst the people who follow and the people who are leaders, the, the leaders who led to hellfire and the followers who followed the leaders to hellfire, they'll both be in hellfire. But yet in the dunya they had these two different classes. And we said in the Parish Nations lecture, I actually defined it as like Meta and Jamhur, right? Which were the um, aristocrats of society and the Jamhur, which are the majority of the people, basically the sheep. Right? And I gave the analogy out of it back then, if you remember from the, um, from the Parish Nations lecture, I said the grasshoppers and the ants. That there's only a few grasshoppers, but they lead the ants, but there's so many ants, but yet they still follow what the grasshoppers say, and so on and so forth. If you viewed the Parish Nations lecture, you know what I'm talking about. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this conversation in detail between the leaders of Hellfire and the followers who were led to Hellfire. They're both in hellfire, but yet what do they say to each other once they're in hellfire? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا فَقَالَ الْضَعَفَاءُ لِلَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا إِنَّا كُنَّا لَكُمْ تَبَعًا فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُغْنُونَ عَنَّا مِنْ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ together before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the weak will say to those who are arrogant right so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines the meta and jamur those grasshoppers and ants as the followers were the weak people and the leaders were the arrogant right so the weak and the arrogant that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines them the arrogant who arrogantly disobeyed Allah and led people to hellfire, and the weak, foolish people that the messengers kept coming to them again and again and again, and they kept listening to their leaders. They kept um, whispering to them to go to hellfire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the weak will say to those who are arrogant, for us, we but followed you, that we followed you, that look, you're our leader, we're in hellfire together, we followed you, فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُغْنُونَ عَنَّا can you avail us of anything from the wrath of Allah? Like, can you do anything for us now? Like, you are our leader, you're our chief, you're that you're head person. Can you avail us of anything of the wrath of Allah now? They reply, if we had received guidance of Allah, we would have given it to you. And then they say, سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْنَا It doesn't matter to, to us. أَجَزِعْنَا أَمْ صَبَرْنَا مَا لَنَا مِنْ That whether we start shouting out in rage and we're angry. You know when someone's in jail and they start banging on, on the walls or something like that? Or whether we sit quietly, it doesn't make a difference, we're going to be here. There's no escape from hellfire. There is no other option once it comes to hellfire. And we said about the people of hellfire that they're always seeking and trying to find a loophole. I remember once I gave an exam, and I said this exam was so difficult. I said in order for it, because it's so difficult, I can't have any loopholes in the end. Meaning that in the end, if someone was to get a re retake, or if someone was to, somehow there was some other way that they could make up for not like doing their exam, then it would ruin the whole thing. And so I made a promise to everybody that this is the exam that I, there's nothing after this. There's no possible way, no extensions, there's nothing. You come 100% or there's nothing after. That's the only way. And in Hellfire, the people, that's just human nature, they're always trying to find a loophole. They're always trying to live their whole life 
thinking that in Hellfire, some way, somehow, there's going to be a loophole. There's some way that they're going to get out of Hellfire. But whether they rage or whether they're patient, there's no escape from Hellfire. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in another verse, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَعْشُرَ مِن ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَنِ نُقَيِّضْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَنِينٌ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَصُدُّونَهُمْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَنَا قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكَ بُعْدَ الْمَشْرِقَيْنِ فَبِئْسَ الْقَرِينُ وَلَن يَنفَعَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ إِذ ظَلَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ فِي الْعَذَابِ مُشْتَرِكُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in these verses and if anyone withdraws himself they turn their backs on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the remembrance of Allah يُقَيِّدْ لَهُ شَيْطَانَ Allah appoints for that person or someone is appointed and, and a devil is appointed for that um, person and they become an intimate companion to him حَتَّى إِذَا جَعَنَا Until and, and that person continues to block the person from the path and that person thinks that they're guided. If you see a person, a person who's going to hellfire, they are the people who don't fear hellfire. If you tell someone, you know, fear hellfire, they're ha ha ha, they laugh. The people who fear it the least are the ones who need to be fearing it the most. And they think that they're the ones who are on the truth. And they think that they're the ones who are guided. Hatta ida jana until that they come. So now the the appointed person, the person who misguided, and the person who was misguided, they're both in hellfire. The leaders and the followers, the arrogant and the weak, they're both in hellfire. They will say to each other that I wish that between me and you was the difference of east and west. فَبِتْ سَلْخَرِينَ what, what a most evil companion you were. That in the end, this companionship led them to hellfire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَنْ يَنْفَعَكُمُ الْيَوْمِ That there is no mercy and no consolation in hellfire. Actually, uh, Sheikh Jafar agrees, his son, when I sent out the email saying that I was doing this lecture, he sent me an email back, he was very excited about this lecture. And he gave me some tips. Um, from Saudi, and he's giving me some tips. And one of the tips, and I'll mention it here, this is his tip. So this one goes out to uh, uh, Yusuf Jafar. He said that in the Quran, if you were, for example, you're in class, okay? And the teacher said, you have detention. And all your friends are basically the go to paradise, and you have detention, you'll feel very sad, right? But if the teacher said that the whole class is in detention, you could go home and when your mother says, you know, why were you in detention? You say, the whole class was in detention. Well, then it's okay. We're all in the same boat. Right? So if you're in hellfire, you're like, oh, you're, let's suppose a Muslim goes to jail, they're detained. When you go to jail, you find there's many Muslims in jail. And so it's almost like a consolation. You know, all my brothers are here. It's a consolation. It's like a little mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Correct? So now, the people of hellfire, do they have access to this mercy? And the answer is no. Even though they and their companions are in hellfire, it will benefit them nothing. And there's no consolation. In fact, it intensifies their punishment. Because they're so mad at each other, that this person is saying, I have nothing to do with you. And this person is saying, you're the one who misguided me. And he said, I didn't do anything. All I did was just tell you, and you're the one who did it yourself. So don't blame me, blame yourself. So the person who led this person to hellfire, may Allah protect you and protect me, is actually intensifying, and it's an internal punishment. It's a punishment of regret and anger. In another verse, and this inshallah ta'ala is now speaking about the people of Jannah. People of Jannah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرُورِ الْمُتَقَابِلِينَ In fact, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu once said to the son of um, Talha radiallahu anhu, Talha was promised Jannah, and Ali radiallahu anhu was promised Jannah. 
And so he said to him, because you know there were some fights that happened amongst the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu would say to his uh, to the son of Talha radiallahu anhu that I pray that Allah um, includes me and your father in the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which he says, Ikhwanan ala surin mutaqabileen. Brothers facing each other on, on uh, like surah, it's like, you know, sofas or thrones, mutaqabileen facing one another. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this. When I was preparing this lecture, to me the, the feeling is almost like it's a group of people who graduated. The people who passed the exam, and it's almost like this is the after exam party. None of the failures are invited, only the people who passed. And so after passing, after they enter Jannah, Alhamdulillah, for everything they passed in and now they're in eternity in Jannah, they're saying salam, salam to each other, peace, and then they sit around, and then they reminisce. It's like the fond memories, the memories. Remember that time? Remember the time we went for Hajj? Remember the time we were fasting? Remember in Ramadan, we were in Qiyam al And they go back and forth on these beautiful events that happened that eventually they were saved from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of these things. So one of these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَقْبَلَ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ And this verse, this statement, أَقْبَلَ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ It actually comes up more than once in the Quran. That they أَقْبَلَ, they, they go to one, one another and they start asking questions to one another. So it's like the memories. قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ إِنِّي كَانَ لِي قَنِينٌ يَقُولُ أَإِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُصَدِّقِينَ أَإِذَا مِتْنَا وَكُنَّا تُرَابًا وَعِظَامًا أَإِنَّا لَمَدِينُونَ This person says that when they meet each other, one of them says to each other, and he says, you know what, I used to have a قَنِين And it's interesting, um, and actually, um, the sister that, that shared this ayah with me, she said that notice that in the Quran, it doesn't call this person who tried to misguide him, doesn't call him a friend, doesn't call him sadiq, or rafiq, or sahib. He says qareem. It's almost like the people who misguide, they're qareem. Allah, maybe that's a topic for some, another, another uh, lecture, inshallah ta'ala. He said, I used to have a qareem, which would be translated as like a companion or someone that was with me. He said, and he used to say, this qareem, this like friend at school or at work or somewhere in the community or someone, he used to say to me, are you going to believe? Are you going to believe in this message of Islam? He said, when we die and we're dust, are we going to be held accountable? Is there going to be a repayment of the judgment? So he's like, I used to have a, a friend like that, a qareem. So the people of Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So they said, why don't we check out on this guy? Where is he now? Where are they now? Someone there saying like, you know when you go to a class, high school reunion, it's 30 years later, something like that, where is this friend from school, this person who used to always, you know, this person who's arrogant, or this person who used to study, or this person who said they would make a million dollars, or this person who used to do this, or this person, what happened to them? So in Jannah they said, They said, let's go and look where he is. So they go and look. So this person, he said, I used to have this buddy and his friend, and he used to tell me, don't believe in this message, and so on. And so they look at Hellfire, and then he finds him right in the middle of Hellfire. That's him. He said, and then he says, By Allah, you almost ruined me. He's like, Aaron, he's like, you're the person who almost got me into the same position. You almost ruined me. Had it not been for the grace of my Lord, had it not been for the grace of my Lord, 
that kuntum min al-muhari, that I would have been one of those who was brought forth to hellfire. And so even this is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person who used to say these things in the dunya, they'll be in hellfire. And the Ahlul Jannah, they will see these people, this is the person who tried to misguide me, Alhamdulillah, I never believed you. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided me and I never listened to you people. SubhanAllah, when I was, um, when I was in high school, it wasn't too long ago, <laughs> and um, here in Canada, feminism was really big. You know, it was like, it was like the start of the movement kind of thing. And it was getting really, really big, and everybody was talking about feminism. Is it still big now? Yeah, it's still big. I don't think it's as big as when I was in high school, but it was really big back then. And there was this woman, I would say like she's the ultimate, like, you know, misguided, saying all these statements of kufr and so on and so forth. And people started listening to her. She'd write books, come on TV and talk. And I thought to myself, one day I was going through a bookstore, and I wanted to purchase her books, because she's like a loud speaker, kind of like really makes you want to listen. And I thought to myself, okay, on the Day of Judgment, if I listen to her and follow her, is she going to avail me anything on the Day of Judgment? Can she protect me from the angels of hellfire? When the wall is divided between the believers and the disbelievers, do I want to be with her? I thought to myself, أعوذ بالله. Like, stay as far away from me as you possibly can, you and your beliefs. Keep them away. I want to be with Ummahat al -Mu'minin. I want to be with all the believing women. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about all the women that came. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them. Those are the people that you want to be with. قَالَتَ اللَّهِ مِنْ كِنْدَ By Allah, you almost ruined me. If it wasn't for the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alhamdulillah that I can listen to you. And so that's the statement that you want to look at. Every time you listen to someone, always ask yourself, are you willing to be with them on the Day of Judgment? Whoever you listen to, are you willing to be with them on the Day of Judgment? In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and actually I, I mentioned this about you know paradise, there is no paradise on earth because of certain things. One of them, we said, for example, in that hadith that we mentioned, here on earth you can get sick. So you can be in Hawaii or Keynes, Australia or something like that, and you get sick, it's not paradise on earth. Right? Secondly, you're going to get old one day. So immortality. And once you get old, it's not paradise on earth. Thirdly, you're going to, while you're there, you're going to get bored after a certain time. So it's not paradise on earth, it doesn't last forever. So subhanAllah, one of the things that messes up paradise on earth is if you go to paradise on earth with a woman or a husband that you're planning to divorce. Okay? So you're in this amazing resort and you're always fighting. You know, everything's beautiful and nice, but you're, all, you're like two days away from a divorce. It's like someone's talking sinful and, and hate talk and all of this stuff. You can't enjoy yourself. So what if a person, yes, they're in Jannah and they're living forever and so on and so forth, but then there's a person in Jannah that's always talking foolishness. They're like talking, like just wasteful talk. You're like, I don't want to be with that person. You know how it is in the dunya, you're trying to avoid certain people because they're just always yapping. Just, they can't, there's no, the run-on sentence that goes on for two hours. Like me, I keep talking in this house. Every day chance that questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Jannah, La yasma'una fiha lahwam wa la takfima illa qilan salaman salama. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La yasma'una fiha. You'll never hear it. It's not that nobody's saying, nobody's saying it, but you'll never hear it in Jannah. Lahwan wa la takfima. You'll never hear vanity. And you will never hear sinful speech. Illa qilan salam and salam. That salam, that peace, that you're in peace and everything is peaceful, and all you, all, all the speech will just be peaceful speaking. And Subhanallah, you might have just a tiny glimpse of that here in the dunya, where there's certain people you speak with, and it's so sweet to speak with them. Correct? You don't even want the conversation to end. It's so beautiful to speak with them. We keep speaking and speaking and speaking. Subhanallah. Illa qilan salaman salaman. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and, and I'll just give you these, these verses one after the other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala greets them with salam. In the, in the Quran, Salam qawlan min rabbir rahim. It's in Surah Yasin. Salam qawlan min rabbir rahim. That peace, that statement of peace, a statement qawlan min rabbir rahim from a Lord that is merciful and gives that mercy. Qawlan min rabbir rahim. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we mentioned this, that the angels, when they're guiding them to Jannah, they say to them, Salam, Salam alaykum bima sabartum They say, Salam alaykum, peace be upon you because you were patient. And so what an amazing and, and most blessed final um, abode this is. And the gatekeepers of Jannah, when they come to Jannah, those who are, you know, they're there in Jannah, they say, Salamun alaykum tibtum fadkhuluha khalidin. They say to them, Salamun alaykum, peace be upon you, tibtum, you've been purified, fadkhuluha khalidin. So enter it, enter into it for all eternity. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, speaks about the people of Hellfire. And now these verses are a little bit more detailed. And you look at like kind of like the intellectual discourse between those leaders, the arrogant ones, and the followers who are the weak ones. And how both of them are in Hellfire, and yet each one is trying to put the blame on the other. Obviously they're both in Hellfire, and it doesn't matter who is to blame. In the end they're both in Hellfire. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ تَرَائِذِ
they have, so, you know, the scientists or the uh, you know politicians or the media, have they actually physically stopped someone from following the message? The answer is no, they haven't. They haven't. Even here in Canada, for example, you see so many times, is there anybody stopping the Muslims from coming and praying in the masjid? No. Nope. Are they praying in the masjid? Not necessarily. They can't blame the leaders, the whole is because of you, we would have been believers. No. Is anybody stopping you? Did anybody say you can't pray? Nobody said that. Nobody's stopping it. There's just these statements running around, but it's more like marketing. But when it really comes down to it, nothing was stopping the person. So now listen to the weak followers. They make an interesting um, rebuttal. They say, And I used to forbid you, 
and I try to stop you from doing the bad things, but I myself never stop myself from doing those wrong things. And this person will be in hellfire just like them. Musa ibn Sa'ad, rahimahullah, and this is something that you see from our righteous um, uh, forefathers, that when they would mention paradise and hellfire, it's as if they put themselves into that position. We said that Ibn Aisha she's reciting these verses, reading it from the first person as if she was there on, in the hereafter. She puts herself in Jannah, reciting these words, and she would recite in the dunya like this. Musa bin Zayd, uh, Musa bin Sa'ad says, Kunna ila jalasna ila Sufyan al-Thawri, kana nao ka, ka'anna nao ka tahatat bina, lam nara min, uh, lima nara min khawfihi wa jaz'i. He said, whenever we would sit with Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, it was as if that hellfire had surrounded us. It was as if we were there in hellfire because of how much he was afraid of hellfire. And how much he feared hellfire, that his fear would rub off on us when we were in the jats and the halaqa of Sufyan al Thawri. The next category that we're speaking about is the people of Jannah speaking with the people of hellfire. And the people of hellfire speaking with the people of Jannah. And there is a, a long detailed um, discourse. It's in Surah Al A'raf. Surah Al A'raf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَادَى أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ أَصْحَابَ النَّارِ أَمْ قَدْ وَجَدْنَا مَا وَعَدَنَا رَبُّنَا حَقًّا فَهَلْ وَجَدْتُمْ مَا وَعَدَ رَبُّكُمْ حَقًّا قَالُوا نَعَمْ فَأَذَّنَ مُؤَذِّنٌ بَيْنَهُمْ أَلَّعَنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَادَى أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ that the people of Jannah called to the people of Hellfire. <laughs> that whatever Allah told us and promised us, we found it to be the truth. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we found it to be the truth. Because they're not in Hellfire, they're asking the people of Hellfire, have you found what Allah promised you to be the truth? They say yes. Everything that Allah mentioned to us, everything that the warners had said, they found it to be the truth. Is it the truth? Sadaqallah. Allah has told the truth. فَأَذَّنَ مُؤَذِّنُ بَيْنَهُمْ And a caller will call amongst them, اللَّعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ That the curse of Allah is upon the transgressors. In another verse, there's some verses that continue about the people of the Araf, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَادَى أَصْحَابُ أصحاب الجنة أن أفيقوا علينا من الماء أو مما أو مما رزقكم الله قالوا إن الله حرمهما على الكافرين الذين اتخذوا دينهم لهوا ولعبا وغرتهم الحياة الدنيا فاليوم ننساهم كما So the people of Hellfire, they call out to the people of Jannah. They say to them, pour some water for us. Like hook us up with something. Get us something. So remember we said the people of Hellfire, they're looking for any way out. Or they're looking for anything. They try calling to the gatekeepers of Hellfire, they try calling to Allah, they're cursing each other, and now they're calling the people of Jannah, أَفِيضُ عَلَيْنَ مِنَ الْمَاءِ And this, أَوْ مِنْ مَا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ And it's interesting, it's like, whatever. They say, whatever. Whatever Allah provides them with, just give us anything. You know, it's like sometimes you tell a person, what would you like? They're like, whatever. They don't care. Whatever. Just give us something. And أَفِيضُ عَلَيْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ يَوْمِ مَا رَزَقَكُمْ Just this drink of water. 
this a drink of water? The Prophet said that this dunya, this dunya, people disobey Allah, they worship idols, and they worship themselves, and they worship all of these things, yet at the end of the day they still get to drink water. And they still get to go to sleep, and they still have shelter, and they're still able to excrete that through their sweat, and they're able to go to the bathroom. All the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their tongue, their eyes, everything, they still get that, even though they spent the whole day disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's because this is the dunya, and it means nothing. The Prophet said that if the dunya meant even the, the wing of a fly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no disbeliever would ever get a drink of water. Not even drinking water. And so they're now in hellfire saying, just give us a drink of water. Or anything, whatever. And the people of Jannah respond back saying, Inna Allah haram al kafir. That Allah has made it haram, it's forbidden for the disbelievers. There's no water. SubhanAllah, I always think in, um, you know, at Hajj time, Hajj time, people get very tired. Very tired. How long can you go being tired for? Like in Hajj time, you might go like 24 hours, you haven't slept. We haven't slept for 24 hours. We haven't slept for 48 hours. Okay, if you hit about like, what's after 48 hours? You're like 70, you would probably be dead at that point. You can't go only to a certain point. But in the end, you're still hoping for a hotel. In the end, you're still hoping for an air-conditioned bus, a soft, uh, uh, plush chair to sit on, a glass of water, a meal, you're waiting for it. There's an expectancy. Now, in hellfire, there's nothing coming. We haven't slept for how long? We haven't eaten for how long? How long has the punishment going on been going on for? We've lost counts. Because it's going on for eternity. And it keeps going on and on. There is no rest. If you could just understand, like when you think about any time you feel like you don't feel like obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something command, just imagine there's no rest in the hereafter. There is no rest. And it's not that you're just sitting there waiting at a bus stop or something like that. There is no rest to the punishment. There's no rest to the punishment. Inna Allah haramahum ala al-kafirin. Who are the disbelievers? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا دِينَهُمْ لَهْمًا وَلَعِبًا Those who took their religion, this is what they considered religion, right? All they did in their lives was لَهْمًا وَلَعِبًا was amusement and distraction. لَهْمًا You know, they call it entertainment. It's interesting, in, 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 um, in Saudi, Saudi Arabia one time, I, I, there was a, a building, and it was called Bayt uh, al-Tafi. Bayt al-Tafi, right? We would translate that, the person who translated that did not know English. And you know how they get, sometimes they get it from, from, from some other country guy who English is his seventh language and stuff like that, he does the translation. So, the proper translation for this store, it, or this place, it's a place that has games, right? Arcade games and, you know, basketball, all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about. Chuck E. Cheese, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is Chuck E. Cheese in Mecca. It's called Big Chuck Feed. The guy translated it as Distraction House. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, SubhanAllah, he got the exact trend. He perfectly translated it. He was perfect. You know, normally they don't translate properly. That was the exact translation. Distraction house. Their whole life, all the religion is about is just about distraction. It's about or what we call, we obviously Shaitan plays games with us. So it's not called distraction. Nobody will say, like, watch the latest distraction. <laughs> no, they say watch the latest movie. Or they don't say, you know, like prime distraction. They say prime entertainment. Correct? It's a changing of words. الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا دِينَهُمْ لَهْمًا وَلَعِبًا Jannah to Firdaus, the highest level of Jannah, is not for people who live in destruction. It's not, that's not the characteristic of people who go to Jannah to Firdaus. وَالَّذِينَهُمْ عَنَ اللَّهُ وَمُعْرِدُونَ They turn away from vanity. 
It's not one of their characteristics that people have got agenda that for those eyes have agenda. So let me give you this example. When I think of distractions, I think of chatting online. A lot of times, like people, they, maybe they're not watching TV, but they've just replaced the television set with another distraction. And their life becomes a distraction. SubhanAllah, like all these emails, you look at your Gmail or something, you never delete your emails, you're like 7,000 emails. And that's like, since you opened your Gmail account, it was just like last, last year. And you've gone on and on, archives and archives of your talk. And my talk, I'm not saying I'm excluded from this, it's just talk, it's just distraction. And so every time, you, every day that you have, you ask yourself, even if you're going to distract yourself, know that it's a distraction and it's only a small portion. So you'd say, for example, I've been good today, I did this, this, and that, now I'm just going to chill. I'm just going to chill for half an hour, I'm just going to chill for this hour, this is my time to relax. And then it's back up again. In fact, when you see Qiyam or Layl, a person will say, do I have to sleep before getting up for Qiyam? It's an interesting question, people always ask, that even your sleep is ibadah because you're like, I'm going to go to sleep, I'm going to chill for an hour, two hours before I get up for Qiyam, before I get up for the night prayer, right? And so even that distraction is, it's, you're building up that energy. Obviously nothing haram in that distraction. But it's there, that small portion of the dunya, so that you would have extra strength for the hereafter. Alright. On TV, if you're awake late at night, you should be praying Qiyam al They have TV shows that are like the highest rated, like Jay Leno. Alright? Jay Leno's on at that time. Who else is on at that time? What's that? David Letterman. David Letterman, yeah, he's been going on for a couple of years. Distraction Club. And Jay Leno and so on and so forth. And then they're like, tonight we have a special guest, you know, so and so, from, he's coming directly from Hellfire. We get to interview him. How many people would like to watch that interview? That would be an amazing interview. Right, it's way more interesting than the latest movie celebrity telling us about how, you know, the upcoming movie and how, you know, it was really difficult filming the movie and stuff like that. Who cares? You actually waste your, you, you exhaust your life finding out about things like that. Even at the end of it, yeah, why do you always forget the, everything that's going on in TV so quickly? Because it means nothing. It means, it's like, it's nothingness. Right? It's like, they, they say empty calories, it's just nothingness. It's just distraction. That's it. It's just a distraction. But now we're going to listen to a really amazing interview. Because we have tonight, someone from Hellfire is coming, and he's going to tell us, how did you get there? Because we definitely don't want to. Now, the interesting thing about a person from Hellfire is from his smell, everybody on earth would die. From his smell. Seeing him, everybody would die. Everything related to him, he would die. But let's just imagine that we're protected and we're able to listen to him. So the question is asked, so what did you do to get into Alpha? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Muddathir, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عَنِ الْمُجْرِمِينَ مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقْرًا because we do have this interview, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recorded it for us in the Qur'an. That they will question the criminals, what got you into hellfire? What made you arrive into hellfire? So this is the response. Some, summed it up for him. You have a problem believing in Allah. 
No, no problem. We'll, uh, everybody's like, it's ingrained. Do you believe Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? The person's like, yeah, I believe that. Do you have a problem praying to God? No, I have no problem. Okay, great, you're Muslim. Repeat after me. Ashhadu. And then Ashhadu. And the guy's like, oh, I guess I'm becoming Muslim. Right? <laughs> because it's a simplification. Because when it comes down to it, your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you pray to Him. Now, a Muslim, sometimes they get confused. They're like, they don't pray, and they're like, Allah's going to forgive us one day. Now, that's really dangerous. Because actually, the next verse that I'm going to talk about are verses that speak about the Munafi team. And that's one of the key beliefs of the hypocrites is that they plant seeds of hellfire thinking that one day God's going to forgive us. But their whole life they planted seeds of hellfire. And so when the seeds come out, did anybody tell you that you have to pray? No, they didn't. Didn't somebody warn you? Yeah, they told us. So, number one thing is called If you're not praying your five prayers, you're fucked. That's, you'll hear me repeat it again and again. Islam is not difficult. You just go to the five pillars of Islam, and that's Islam. That will bring you to Jannah. And that is belief in Allah, belief in the Messenger of Allah, your Salah, to pray your five prayers, your Fadr, right? Fajr the Ha'asim of Isha, to give your Zakat, right? The 2.5% on the money you're earning at the end of the year. It's a lot cheaper than the taxes you're paying, so like 55%. 2.5% to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Masakeen. Um, your zakah, your siyam, your fasting in Ramadan. And many people, alhamdulillah, normally even if they're not practicing Islam, they're still fasting in Ramadan. Siyam and hajj, to do hajj sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the basis of your life, and you'll be saved. And it's very easy. So the number one reason that they got to Al-Khar, number two is interesting as well. And we never used to feed the needy people. So if this is a characteristic of the highest characteristics of the people that went to Al-Khar, ask yourself, when was the last time you fed a needy person? I could even say, when was the last time you donated anything? And I'm saying that that's just our culture. We don't donate. Yeah, at the masjid sometimes, someone will say, brothers, sisters, please donate to the masjid, right? We donate to the building. When was the last time you donated anything? Right? If you, if you put a coin in the box, you would hear it clang at the bottom. Correct? Do you agree? So you, someone tried out after. There's nothing in the box. Correct? Do you agree with me? Now, if the people of Hellfire said, we were never amongst those who used to feed the needy people. It wasn't our characteristic. This is what a characteristic of the people of Hellfire. And so what you need to do, and now the Masaki, the needy people, are we talking about Muslim needy people? Of course, they're included, but needy people is anybody needy. Is anybody needy. When you ever see, when you see people downtown asking for money, immediately everybody thinks they're going to use it on drugs. Right? They're going to use it to buy drugs. Allah, I'm not going to give them. Okay, you didn't give them. Who did you give them? I'm going to give it to the Muslims. Okay, great. When did you give it to the Muslims? Never. It's just you didn't give that guy and you didn't give anybody. As you don't know this guy, even though maybe he does have drugs or something like that, do you think he needs to eat? And if he buys with drugs, he just buys drugs with his money, he's not going to eat. So eating, if you didn't know, was one of his needs. So now this person, I was once, and I'm not saying like I run around downtown all the time giving people, it's a reminder for myself, a reminder for you. I was once downtown one place, I said, you know what, I'm going to give these needy people. They were actually sleeping outside, this was in Boston once. They were sleeping outside. I've seen people sleep on the street like that in Hajj time. But they, these people have a home just in Hajj, they're just sleeping on the street. I've seen that before. In downtown Boston, um, you'll see people sleeping in the street, they have no home. They're on the street. And so I said, you know what, I'm not going to give them money, I'm going to go in and go buy some food for them. And 
I went in, and there's people asking for money outside the door. But I said, you know what, I'm going to buy the food and just give them the food. So I bought all these, um, you know, sandwiches and so on and so forth. And then I came outside and I saw them counting their money. The guys were sitting there, here's 10 cents, here's 25 cents, here's the money that you donated. And, and I gave them the sandwich. And they're like, thanks man, we were just putting our money together to see if we could buy one. And then I went to the people, some of them slept, and I'm sure that they slept without eating. And I put the sandwiches, you know, by their beds. You know, somewhere that no one would steal it from there, but somewhere if they woke up, they would find the sandwich. It is the characteristic of the people of Hellfire, they do not feed the needy people. And so again, understanding that, you now know what the characteristic of the people of Jannah are. They feed the needy people. And so if I can advise you this, if I advise you with this, there's um, Islamic Relief has a beautiful, um, uh, you can type in like Islamic Relief, they have an orphan sponsorship program. And inshallah ta'ala, this is my salah, I'm telling you about this great service. They have an orphan sponsorship program, you pick the country, you can even pick the orphan that you want to sponsor, and it tells you that every month you'll be paying like $33 a month, or in certain countries it's more expensive. You pay every month and automatically you can either pay for the whole year or you can they'll bill your credit card or your um, your payment online each month. So that each month you'll donate, even when you forget to donate, you've automated your donations. So you'll be sitting there checking your email, distraction, distraction, distraction. You say your payment has been received to orphans, so and 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 so. You can sponsor as many orphans as you can each other. And then you say, Alhamdulillah, that this characteristic won't apply to you. وَلَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْلَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ وَلَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ وَلَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِينَ وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ الْيَوْمَ الْدِينَ They used to just, you know, خَوْضْ uh, is just, they just dwell into matters, it's like their disbelief and their philosophy and all of this stuff. They just, all this disbelief, they just kept going on and on and on about it. It's actually interesting, subhanAllah, there's a statement, they said, in recorded history, there has never been known to be a happy philosopher. They're all depression. They're all depressed. All the philosophers, they're all depressed. Right? They're cold. they're just talking and talking and talking. What could not Nukhetib be Yomadin? Nukhetib means, basically, you know, we used to disbelieve. Even in the English language, I don't like to say that disbelieve. You don't understand what disbelieve means. Rather, every time someone told them that there's a hereafter, they say, you're lying. You're lying. It's not true. There's a hereafter. No, you're lying. It's not true. They just kept doing takdeeb. They would say, it's not true. We don't believe in you. It's not true. And they keep going on and on like that. And the last, um, the last verses that we'll be going through tonight, inshallah ta'ala. Because when we're speaking about, we speak about Jannah and, and we're speaking about hellfire, you might mistakenly think that there are only two groups. But there are actually three groups. Where did the third group go? Hellfire too. <laughs> They're in Hellfire too. So it's, Jannah has one group of people, those are the believers. And Hellfire has two groups of people. Those are the Kuffar and the Munafiqeen. The Munafiqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ That the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites, those who outwardly said that they were Muslims or believers, but inwardly they weren't believers. And now this is where the really scary thing comes up. SubhanAllah, the reason that they got into hellfire, into hellfire, I went through the list, I have this list, it's four things. And I tried thinking about it, like applying it to like a general community, a general Muslim community. And the scary thing is, it almost all applies. So pay attention. Pay attention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look upon يَوْمَ تَرَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَسْعَى نُورُهُمْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَبِأَيْمَانِهِمْ بُشْرَاكُمُ الْيَوْمِ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the believers, believing men and women, on the day when you'll see the believing men and women, نُورُهُمْ يَسْعَى They have light. It's like, yes, it's like, it's coming from everywhere. 
the believers are full of light. And it actually is interesting. The Prophet said in the hadith in which he said, He says, Give glad tidings like good news for those who walk in the darknesses to the masjids that they will have complete light on the day of resurrection. And so giving good news is not on the day of judgment you give good news. Of course that's the good news. But it's give good news to the people in the dunya. So it's like every time you come for Isha, every time you come for Fajr, if you look outside right now, it's really dark outside. So good news for all of you, inshallah ta'ala. You came here in the darkness of the night to pray in the masjid, to be reminded of Allah. So I give you good news, inshallah ta'ala, that you'll have complete light on the day of resurrection. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the believing men and women. And again, this applies to men and women. The nur is coming from all directions and so on. This is the ultimate. There is no success other than this success. And Fawz al And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, On the day when the munafiqoon, when munafiqat, the hypocrite men and the hypocrite women, right? So this applies, just like paradise applies to men and women, hellfire applies to men and women. Munafiqoon wa munafiqat, lillaheena aman. These are the, uh, the hypocrites. In the dunya, the hypocrites were standing side by side with the believers. Right? So in the dunya they were together, but now in the hereafter they're going to be separated, right? So they're saying to them, The hypocrites have no light on the day of resurrection. And the believers have this glowing light. But the angels of paradise start taking away the believers. And the hypocrites are being left behind. You know, subhanAllah, it's interesting, I kept thinking, you know, if you ever travel and, you know, you're waiting for your visa to go through or maybe you're sitting in a lobby waiting and, you know, someone calls you, you get to go through and your friend says, wait for me, and you're like, forget you, man, I'm going, right? I'm not going to wait here in this punishment. And what about the, and the friend's like, well, you know what, if, if I was in your situation, if I got to go through first, I would have waited for you, something like that, right? They're, the munafiqun are held back. And the believers get to go forward to Jannah. So they say to the believers, the Munafiqun say to the believers, They're like, if you go, we have no lights. With you goes all the lights. And we're in darkness. And the verse, Munduruna, there's, there's difference in amongst, uh, amongst the Mufassirin, but they say that it means actually, wait for us. Wait till our affair is, has like finished, we're not done yet. Wait for us to complete, and, and then we can go together to Jannah. And then it will be said, It said to them, get away. They're not part of this delegation in the entourage. They're saying, wait for us, don't go yet, we're not done yet. We won't have any light if you go. So it will be said to them, اِرْجِعُوا وَرَاءَكُمْ فَالْتَمِسُوا نُورًا اِرْجِعُوا وَرَاءَكُمْ فَالْتَمِسُوا نُورًا It's said to them, go, go back, go away, and go and um, go and get light of your own. And now, again, in the Muslim, they're talking about this. It's almost like sarcasm. It's like saying to them, if you can, go back to the dunya, and go and get light from its source which is Iman and Allah and His Messenger, and the Salah, the fasting, and the Siyan, the Zakat, and so on, that's the source of light in this dunya when you are alive. But it's sarcasm because they have no access to that anymore. And you have that opportunity now. You have access to the light. قِيلَ رُجِعُ وَرَاءَكُمْ فَالْتَمِسُ نُورَ Go and get your own light. فَضُرِبَ بَيْنَهُ بِسُورِ اللَّهُ بَابِ and then at that point, a wall 
is erected between the believers that entourage is going to Jannah and those who are going to hellfire, a wall goes up. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala used to read this verse and cry, saying that when that wall goes up, I don't know which side of the wall I'll be on. And so now you imagine, when that wall goes up, what side of the wall are you going to be on? What side am I going to be on? If that wall goes up, and you're on the side of mercy, the side that's leading to Jannah, then how thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are you going to be? And if you're on the side, where you're on the other side, where it's the punishment and leading to hellfire, there's no happiness forever and ever and ever and ever. And so as the wall goes up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that the munafiqin say, say to them, يُنَادُونَهُمْ So the wall is going up, and they're saying to them, أَلَمْ نَكُمْ مَعَكُمْ Weren't we with you? Did we stand beside you in prayer? Did we do this? Did we do that? Weren't we with you in the dunya? And the believers will say to them, قَالُوا بَلَى You were with us. And now here's the reason that the wall goes up and they're on the other side. قَالُوا بَلَى وَلَا كِنَّكُمْ They said, yes, you were with us in body. You were with us. But now here are the four things. This is why when the wall goes up, you'll be on the other side. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ فَتَنْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَتَرَبَّصْتُمْ وَرُتَّبْتُمْ وَغَرَّتْكُمُ الْأَمَانِ حَتَّى جَاءَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَغَرَّكُمْ بِاللَّهُ And so they said four things. Number one, number one, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ فَتَنْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ You did a fitna to yourselves. You basically put yourself into trial. What that means is like someone, for example, I'll just give you some examples. Someone, they don't have to deal in riba, but they say, no, I want, to, I want to get interest payments. I want to make more money. So they put themselves into fitna. Someone else will say, you know, I, I, I just want to look at these pornography websites. And I just want to commit these problems. And nobody can see me, but I just want to drink alcohol. And so they did fitna to themselves, right? They put themselves through these trials. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ فَتَنْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ now, all human beings make mistakes and all human beings sin. So these people put a fitna through themselves. It's interesting that the next reason that, in, that the wall was up and they're in hellfire, even though they were the believers, is when you delayed. Everybody makes sins and everybody um, commits mistakes. But yet the munafiqi and their characteristics is they delay tawbah. They delay repentance to Allah. What does it mean to delay repentance to Allah? Because someone will be like, if you commit a sin, you, inshallah ta'ala, you're not like that. If you sin, you're like, stuff and you sin, you repent. But here are some things that you might find in the community. Someone will say, you know what, I'm in university right now, and I have to get good marks, so I'll fast in Ramadan after I graduate from school. After residency and after this and after that, twelve years later, I'll repent to Allah. Or someone, even let me bring it on a smaller scale, will say, "I'm busy at work. I'll pray my prayers later. I'll pray them at some later time. I'll try to like put them together at some later time. I call it qaza. Is that what they call? Obviously, that doesn't count." Other people say, let's wait till we get married, and then we'll do tawbah. So yes, sister, you don't wear hijab, don't worry about it. Wait till you get married, you can repent later. That doesn't count. Repentance is immediate. Other people, they might commit zina. They'll be like, they'll commit zina, and they're fornicating. And they'll say, I'll be chast once I get married. And they delay their tawbah. Other people will say that, you know, I'm involved in a riba mortgage, and I know, I know it's haram and stuff, and I'm going to go for hajj after I pay off my house. And then I'll repent to God. And other people wait for hajj. They'll say, when I go for hajj, I'll repent. 
Dear brothers and sisters, you never know if you'll live till tomorrow. You never know if you'll live even for Hashem tonight. And you never know if you'll be there at Fajr time. And so when do you do Tawbah? Will you do Tawbah immediately? Every time you remember to do Tawbah, you say stuff. I ask your forgiveness and your protection from Allah. The Prophet wasallam said, to repent to Allah and ask for His forgiveness, for verily, the Prophet he said that I repent to Allah in a day more than 70 times. And so it's like every ten Prophet is doing stuff up. And Abu Hurairah said, we're sitting with the Prophet and while he's speaking, he's doing his tafah. And he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And he's the messenger of Allah. So we see when the characteristics of the people of Jannah is they hasten their asking of forgiveness. And so if a person commits a sin, they might say, well, I don't know if I can get out of this sin or not. Still repent to Allah. Still repent to Allah. Every time you commit this sin, repent to Allah. Even the... I'm trying to give an example of these things. A person saying, you know, every Salah person who misses, do complete istighfar. Even if you're going to miss the next prayer, still do istighfar. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Because eventually, the hypocrisy is going to pull you in one direction. Either you're going to stop asking for forgiveness at some point, or you're going to actually listen to what you're saying you're going to desist from committing that sin. So the fitna, they did a fitna to themselves. They delayed the tawbah. Number three is they doubted the messengers. They doubted the messenger. I'm not sure if this is the true or not. I'm not really sure yet. And there's one issue, and that's usually the issue of hijab. I'm not like kind of like knocking on the sisters who don't wear hijab. In fact, I'm so happy that a sister would be revering the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And usually, um, this is being recorded. So this is intimate. It's between me and the person I'm speaking to. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or so on. But usually, my sister in Islam, when she says why she doesn't wear hijab, she'll say, I'm not sure. And that's one of the characteristics of the hypocrisy. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when that wall goes up, they delayed tawbah, and they doubted the messengers. And so it is never going to be for the success of the person to doubt the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead, if a person is committing a sin, what they should do, this is the same thing, is if they're committing a sin, don't justify it. Don't try to go from shaykh to shaykh trying to find some shaykh that says it's okay. Accept full force that it's haram. Accept full responsibility. Don't blame anybody. Don't blame all my parents didn't teach me or something. Don't blame anybody. And do tell it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if you continue in the sin. So if a person is going to a pornography website, on their tongue they should be saying a stuff for the love, a stuff for the love, a stuff for which with every picture that they see. Astaghfirullah. That's an intense moment. If you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing istighfar at the same time, you're being pulled in different directions, and if you say, this is the good news, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Allah will save you protect you. If you ask Allah for protection from shaitan, Allah will protect you. But you can't let go of tawbah. And you can't doubt the Prophet You can't doubt him. Don't let go of that tawbah, that tawbah. This is the last one. This one is the last reason that the munafiqin, when the wall goes up and they'll be in hellfire, is that they were deceived and deluded by al-amani. What is al-amani? Amani is wishful thinking. I want to make a billion dollars. It's wishful thinking, brother. Right? What do you want? And people, they just throwing things off the top of their head. I, I'd like to go to Jannah to for those. Here's another one. Here's another one. When you tell people like, um, who would like to memorize the Quran? For the majority of people, it's just wishful thinking. Correct? Now that's, that's a deep one. You're like, are you, what are you saying? I'm challenging you. I'd ask you right now, who wants to memorize the Quran? Everybody raise their hand up, and I'll say, that's just wishful thinking. Why do I say that it's wishful thinking? 
Because if you want to memorize the Quran, you have to plant certain seeds if you're sincere in your wish, in your, in your desire, correct? If you want to memorize the Quran, stay tonight for another two hours as we begin our first Quran lesson. You have to come after Fajr for one hour, and then during the day for another three hours, then come at Maghrib time, Maghrib to Isha every day for the next year or two years. And you don't have Sundays off either, seven days a week. Now do you understand why I say it's wishful thinking? Because you haven't planted the seeds. Right? So one of the scholars has said that, oh, I wish I could just go to an Islamic library and just lie down. And by the spirit of osmosis, <laughs> all this, uh, this bukhur comes out from the books and just goes into my head. And I wake up as the greatest scholar that Islam has ever known. I wish, I wish. That's not how knowledge is learned. That's not how knowledge is learned, correct? You actually have to open a book and read it. And you have to go cover to cover. And you have to study, and you have to learn. There are seeds that are planted. And so, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that the believers are saying to them as the wall goes up, that they did fitna to themselves. They didn't do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, they delayed their tawbah. The third thing was they doubted the messenger. And the fourth thing was that they lived with wishful thinking. They didn't live in truth, they just lived with wishful thinking. Until the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came, and they were, and they died, and they went to hellfire like this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you, protect me. And with that, we are um, done inshallah ta'ala for this part one. Next week inshallah ta'ala, um, on Tuesday, uh, we're going to be doing the part two, which is actually, it's a continuation. The, um, the sections that I didn't mention next week, inshallah ta'ala, specifically, we're going to be speaking about the conversations that the people of paradise have with themselves, the internal dialogue, and the internal dialogue of the people of hellfire. And then we're going to be speaking about the conversation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has with the people of Jannah, and the statements that are said to the people of hellfire. Jazakumullah khayyana for everybody who helped to prepare this lecture for all of you who are attending. And again, inshallah ta'ala, if you want to get on my mailing list, the mailing list is, um, this is the website, if you want to write it down again, it's successinislam.com.